The woods have always been a place of solace for many, but beneath the canopy of trees lies a world of dark mysteries and terrifying encounters. So today, we're revisiting some of our most chilling stories about people who ventured into the wilderness and came face to face with the unknown. From rangers to surveyors, these first-hand accounts will make you think twice about what's really lurking in the woods. You won't want to miss this one. It's December 2nd, 1974, and 68-year-old William Bosack is tired. A farmer's co-op meeting in the tiny northwestern Wisconsin community of Frederick has just ended, and William is headed back to his property on County Road West. As he heads southeast away from town into the heart of Polk County, he starts thinking of all the chores he has to do the next day. Like any dairy farmer, William is a practical man and a hard worker. He is always up before sunrise. Normally, he is in bed shortly after the sun sets, but not tonight. No, it's pushing 10 p.m. and William is well past his bedtime. And so William is trying his best to stay alert and the conditions on the road aren't exactly helping. As he gets closer to home, he starts noticing thick patches of fog, making it difficult to see very far ahead. William slows down as he reaches each fog bank, trying to make sense of the way that his headlights scatter in the thick mist. Well, 10 p.m. comes and goes, and William goes on another patch of low-hanging dense fog around 10.30. He's frustrated, but knows that he is less than a mile from his farm. He'll be home in no time. So, William slows down one final time to get through the fog, but now, up ahead, there's something different, barely visible in all the murkiness. He can't say exactly what, but it's enough to make him hit the brakes a little harder. Slowly, it comes into view through the haze. There, on the left-hand side of the road, is an object. It isn't moving, it's standing completely still. And so William slows down a little more, thinking maybe it's a car stalled on the shoulder of the road. But it can't be a car. I mean, for starters, the shape is all wrong. Instead of the angular lines of a car from the 1970s, there are curves. In fact, all William can see is a curve, like an enormous sphere or bubble on the side of the road. And by now, William's car is absolutely crawling because he still can't make out what this thing is. Finally, he's right on top of it, and he gets a better look at last. William said that the object was curved in the front and stretched somewhere between 8 and 10 feet above the ground. It looked like it might be anywhere from 3 to 6 feet wide. Now, William realizes it isn't shaped like a ball at all. Really, it's more like an egg or a bullet, with a pointer section towards the top. William later said that the shape it reminded him of most was a chemistry lab bell jar. As for the bottom, well, William can't see much. The fog is just too thick down there, and his headlights don't offer any real clues. But as William's car creeps closer, he comes to a sickening realization. The object doesn't look like it's touching the ground at all. Meaning, whatever it is, it almost looks like it's floating above the shoulder of the road, suspended in midair. As alarming as this is, though, what happens next leaves William absolutely shocked. Because whatever this thing might be, it looks almost like a vehicle of some sort. It's not opaque. It's transparent, meaning that the headlights on William's car light up the hole inside as clearly as if it were made of glass. And there's something inside. Trapped within the floating glass jar is what William described as a figure with its arms raised above its head. He later told journalists, I can't remember it just as if it were yesterday. It was looking out of the window, and it was a different kind of character than you'd see on this earth. It was a little taller than a tall man. It looked a good deal like a man, but it had a different looking face than you'd see. It had a cow-looking face. The mouth and the nose seemed quite flat. 
but I couldn't remember real well. It was so foggy, and now it's pretty shook up. William went on to describe the creature in greater detail. The head was somewhat rectangular. He said that the creature seemed to be entirely covered from head to toe in dark tan fur. Well, William wasn't entirely sure it was fur. I mean, maybe it was a skin-tight jumpsuit, but whatever it was, it looked like fur. In fact, the only parts of its body that weren't hairy, the only parts that William could see, at least, were its face and chin. The face had hair on the sides, and from these clumps of fur, a pair of ears, each shaped like a calf's, stuck out on either side, both about three inches long. The eyes, William said, were so large that they almost seemed to protrude from the face with absolute terror. All William can see is the upper half of its torso because the lower half of the body, like the vessel it's trapped inside, is hidden by the thick layer of fog hovering above the road. Now, obviously, William is completely amazed by this, but the weirdest part of the creature isn't the way it looks, it's how it is reacting, because William says that the creature looks just as scared as I was. The strange being had his hands up as though to show he was surrendering or to show he meant no harm. His eyes showed intense fright. Now, to William, it was obvious that the creature was absolutely terrified. If it wasn't showing how harmless it was, maybe it was trying to signal to William for help. Either way, it was obvious to William that the creature wanted no part in whatever was happening. In fact, in subsequent interviews, William kept referring to the creature as the human, meaning that he clearly sympathized with the entity and felt like it was much of a victim as he was. He and the being even locked eyes during this period. When I got right alongside the vehicle, which was about six or eight feet away, he was watching me. Now remember, William is a no-nonsense kind of fella, a down-to-earth farmer with no interest whatsoever in flying saucers. He is a senior citizen. So the idea that he's making this up for fortune and fame just doesn't really make much sense. He has everything to lose and nothing to gain from an experience like this. In fact, after he finally blinks and breaks eye contact with the cow person, William feels his heart rate jump into high gear, and all he wants to do is get out of there as soon as possible. He's been going super slow all this time, trying to take in as many details as he can. And William said it must have only been around 10 seconds that he saw this thing, but it felt like much, much longer. Minutes, even. But now, William is ready to get the heck out of Dodge, because if that thing is a victim... What's keeping him from being captured too? William realizes that, although seeing this weird sight has him feeling a million miles away. Home is just around the corner. In fact, if there wasn't so much fog, he could even see his farm from this bend in the road. And so, fog or no fog, William slams his foot on the gas and peels away from the entire scene as quickly as he can. The fog parts, the glow of the object fades into his rearview mirror, replaced by the comforting illumination from the lights on his farm on the ridge up ahead. William is sure that if he can just get home, he can put all this madness behind him. But that's when something even stranger happens, because as William is fleeing from the fog, he notices that the interior of his car is starting to get dark. He said, As I passed, it seems the object came right toward my car, and it became very dark in the car. Everything from the light reflecting back from his headlights to the lights on his dashboard, it's all dimming as if someone has dropped a dark blanket over his vehicle. And then his headlights start to dim and his engine grows quieter. It's almost like his car is dying, but he keeps moving forward on the road. And just when William thinks that his night can't get any weirder, he hears an out-of-place sound. You see, William knows this stretch of road well. It's not even a mile from his farm at this point. He knows there aren't any trees low enough to scrape the top of his vehicle. But this is exactly what he hears. The unmistakable sound of low-hanging branches. A kind of soft whooshing sound 
followed by a scraping noise. William assumes this is the craft taking off into the air. He later said, It did definitely seem as, as though it came right at me, and there seemed to be a tremendous surge of power. The sensation only amplifies the adrenaline rushing through William's body. He's entering another fog bank. Now, he's entering another fog bank now, but he doesn't care. He puts the pedal to the metal and takes over, covering the last bit of road until he reaches the driveway of his farm. Here, the 450 acres that he's worked for 40 years, he finally feels safe. William wheels into his driveway. It sits higher than the surrounding terrain and overlooks the exact spot where he just saw, well, whatever it was. And so William gets out of his car and he's just starting to calm down. He heads inside, knowing he'll be safe and sound if anything escalates. William sets up at a window that allows him to peer over the edge of his property, down the hill and to the road below. And he can't see a thing out of the ordinary. There aren't any lights anymore. Just the same thick, impenetrable wall of fog that he was stuck in a few moments ago. After about a half an hour of staring out onto the road, another car passes through the fog. It doesn't seem bothered in the slightest meaning that whatever William had seen down there is now gone. At this point, there's nothing for William to do. He heads to his room and climbs into bed. He doesn't tell his wife what just happened, nor does he tell his son. But that doesn't mean that they didn't notice a distinct change in William Bosack over the next few days. Later, when he finally came forward to share his story with the public, William admitted to reporters, I was so gall darn scared. I was afraid to go out at night for a few days. I was pretty shook up for a couple of weeks. As if this wasn't enough of a clue that something had happened to William. He didn't get up as early as usual the following morning. He slept in a little, and when he finally did rise, he didn't work on the farm. Instead, he headed back down the road, where just a few hours earlier, he had come face to face with the unknown. Part of William scolded himself for being so spooked now, in the light of day, with the sun having long ago burned off the fog, it all seemed so silly. In fact, another part of him was doubting that anything had happened at all. And that was when he found it. There, in a hayfield on the side of the road where the object had appeared, was a depression in the earth. It was circular, as if something six feet in diameter had momentarily descended to touch the ground, before taking off again for parts unknown. William couldn't believe it. It was too much of a coincidence, the vision in the fog, and then this circle in the hay. The feelings from the night before came flooding back, and in an instant, William Bosack was back in that moment. It had been real. As William fought back the terror that washed over him, he noticed another emotion come pouring in, regret because, as William later said, I wish that somebody had been in a car with me at the time. I should have stopped and tried to show it I was friendly. I wish I could meet up with it again. Now, I, I wouldn't hesitate to stop. Well, William tried his best to shove his emotions to the side. He had neglected work on the farm, and in the meantime, the chores kept piling up. The best thing to do was get back to it. William tried his best to return to being a farmer but keeping his secret bottled up just didn't work for him. The more time passed, the more that feeling of regret crept in. Could he have helped that terrified creature somehow? That thing that, in his mind, looked more like a person than an animal? Eventually, he had no choice but to come forward and spill the beans to his family three weeks after his signing. And you know how that goes. Word eventually gets out. Eventually, all of Polk County, Wisconsin, was talking about the strange experience of William Bosack. This naturally attracted the attention of the media. Since Frederick is only about 90 minutes north of St. Paul, Minnesota, one of the local newspapers, the St. Paul Pioneer Press, dispatched reporters to interview William. The newspaper carried a sketch of the encounter, which William said was fairly accurate. The only difference was that the ears were actually placed a little higher on the creature's head. In describing his initial reaction to a sighting, 
William went on the record as saying, The first thing I thought of was, what in the world is that? I was going to stop, but I decided not to. There's so much more advanced than we are. I figured if I got out of the car, I might end up dead on the side of the road. The next day, people would think I just died of a heart attack. William went on to speculate that he had seen a genuine, unidentified flying object. What's more, he drew some connections between the cow-like entity and persistent rumors of livestock mutilations across the United States. Was there some significance between flying saucers harming cows and the fact that the entity trapped in the glass UFO seemed to resemble a cow-human hybrid? Well, as word continued to spread, ufologists eventually got wind of what became known as the BOSAC humanoid. Investigators from APRO, Wisconsin's owned aerial phenomena research organization, soon descended upon the BOSAC farm. APRO investigators Everett E. Leitner and Dewey Bershide interviewed William Bosack. The January to February 1975 issue of the APRO Bulletin carried a brief write-up on his sighting, concluding that Mr. Leitner, who investigated the case, found Bosack to be sincere and a man with a good reputation in his community. As for William Bosack himself, he stood by the authenticity of his encounter until the day he died, December 2nd, 1996. In fact, 22 years to the day after his fateful encounter in rural Wisconsin. But it wasn't easy. Sticking to the truth all those years, back in 1974, William said this. You know how the neighbors are. They questioned it. The editor in town didn't believe it. You know, though, something. If you ever thought of outer space, it's just fantastic, isn't it? A lot of people can imagine such things, but this is a fact. I'm sure a lot of people are going to be skeptical after hearing what happened to me, but if people don't believe me, I'll take a lie detector test to prove this isn't just something I made up. I've decided to talk now so that anybody else who sees something like what I saw will maybe know what to do and maybe even try to communicate with it. There are other people that have seen something like that right in this area. This last line is especially interesting. What was William referring to? Well, as it turns out, Wisconsin is seen by some as something of a UFO hotspot. In fact, at least three towns in the state, Belleville, Dundee, and Elmwood, have referred to themselves as the UFO capital of the world, just due to the sheer number of sightings there. Granted, none of these are in Polk County, but that doesn't mean that UFOs haven't been spotted there too. As it turns out, some sightings even occurred around the same time as the Bosak humanoid. For instance, the same month that William Bosak had his encounter, Gunnard Linder also saw a strange nocturnal light in the sky near Frederick. Two months later, a man named Ray Kurkowski also saw similar lights above town outside a bar. And in early September of 1979, no less than five eyewitnesses, including a 25-year-old Army veteran, spotted an immense, shiny, metallic, football-shaped object in the sky just outside of Dresser, which is another town in Polk County. The UFO got within 200 yards of his car as it traveled down County Road MM. He pulled over to watch, only to be joined by a trucker who did the same thing. But none of these sightings address the strangest thing about the Bosak humanoid. The fact that the creature itself seemed to be in the process of being abducted. Remember, the poor thing looked absolutely terrified, at least according to William Bosak. If that is indeed true, then dozens of questions arise. Questions with really weird implications. For instance, was the Bosak humanoid from another planet or was it from Earth? Was it being abducted for the same reasons that UFOs kidnap human beings, or was it something different, maybe a prisoner of war between opposing factions? Some researchers think that what William Bosack saw on December 2nd, 1974 was actually a Bigfoot. Granted, William's description of the creature's ears doesn't really support that theory. But otherwise, it's hard to deny the similarities between the Bosack humanoid and descriptions of large hairy hominids throughout North America. And as luck would have it, 
Wisconsin has its share of Bigfoot sightings as well. But Bigfoot and UFOs? Don't get your peanut butter in my chocolate, man. Okay, Josh, that was a, that was a weird joke. But here's the thing. Bigfoot and UFOs are seen together more often than they should be. But here's the thing. If Bigfoots are nothing more than just undiscovered terrestrial primates. For instance, in 1973, Pennsylvania was flooded with reports, not just of Bigfoot, not just of flying saucers, but of both, sometimes even seen together. Sometimes one would appear in the same area just after the other, and in a handful of cases, the two appeared at the same time. Now, a lot of these examples are covered in researcher Stan Gordon's excellent book, Silent Invasion. But even these stories don't quite sound the same as the Bosak humanoid case. If you look long enough, though, you can find other examples where UFOs are spotted interacting with, sometimes even capturing, large hairy hominids. One absolutely wild story was collected by APRO, the same organization that was first to investigate the Bosak humanoid. According to researchers Leo Sprinkle and John Durr, a couple had purchased a ranch in Clearwater, Colorado in 1975. From the moment they arrived, they started experiencing a little bit of everything. Cattle mutilations, anomalous noises, and sightings of both UFOs and Bigfoot. Well, one night in January of 1977, the father and his oldest son were investigating some burn marks left by UFOs on their property the year before. But when they reached the top of the hill, they noticed a strange glow coming from the nearby woods. It was like a golden beam of light that seemed to shine between the trees. The family is well acquainted with high strangeness, so instead of being frightened, the father and son headed in the direction of the light. On the way there, they stumbled across a black box on the ground, making a buzzing noise. As they drew nearer, the sound only grew more intense, so the father and his son retreated back to their car. After making sure that his son was safe, the father went back to investigate the box alone. When he finally returned to the car, he had a wild story to tell. As it turns out, the father told his son that when he got back to the spot, it was gone. Instead, the light had started pouring out of the trees again, and then from the depths of the woods, two silhouettes emerged. They looked like blonde-haired, big-eyed human beings, wearing silver suits that changed color. In other words, the kind of UFO occupants that some people call the Nordics. The Nordics made it clear that they meant the father no harm. In fact, they supposedly said to him, How nice of you to come. It only gets weirder, though. The father said that, although the box was out of sight, he can now see a landed flying saucer. It sat down a hill about 50 or 60 feet in the distance. Apparently, the two beings that had confronted the father apologized for all the trouble that they had caused on his property. They also shared several things that the father promised to keep a secret. Yeah, okay. When at last the father mentioned the black box that he and his son had found, the beings told him that he was wise to have bet off from it. Weird enough for you? Okay, buckle in because it's only getting stranger. The father said that the two beings, presumably aliens, pointed in a direction where they said the black box still sat. When they did so, a loud beep sounded, and get this, a Bigfoot appeared. Apparently, it had been lying on the ground, camouflaged. According to what the father said, once the Bigfoot was on its feet, it headed in the direction of the box. When it got closer, the tone of the beep changed again, and the creature dropped to the ground as though incapacitated. It's a wild story, I get it. According to the father, the entire exchange only took around five minutes. Like a lot of the things we talk about, no one can say whether it really happened or not. But if there's even a little bit of truth to the tale, it suggests a relationship between UFOs and Bigfoot, Bigfoot, UFOs and Bigfoot, either that the UFO occupants are collecting or studying the creatures, or, weirdly enough, that the Bigfoot are under the control of the UFOs, somehow. So what's going on? Do Bigfoot come from UFOs? Are UFO occupants just studying Bigfoot the same way that human beings would if we ever got the chance to? 
Or is there a war or some sort of exchange program going on between Bigfoot and whoever is piloting the UFOs? I mean, the questions are endless. But do you know what's not endless? The mysteries the forest holds. That's right, folks. And one comes to mind, a man named Ray Sullivan. His story is as fascinating as it is strange. Check it out. Roy Sullivan was born in 1912 in Greene County, Virginia. As a young boy, he worked the farm with his father and his duties involved everything that would entail, including helping complete the fall harvest on time. And it was during one of these chores that Roy had his first brush with death. According to Roy, he was out working in the fields with his father when a storm rolled in. Roy had been given a scythe to help cut the wheat, but as he swung the handle across the yellow shafts of grain, a lightning bolt flew down from the sky right above him. Although it terrified the boy, it didn't strike him directly. It only hit the blade of the scythe. Now, because of this, Roy was not injured. However, official tallies of Roy's lightning strikes do not usually include this childhood incident. I mean, after all, it wasn't a direct hit, and there was no way to verify the authenticity of this claim, but every one of Roy's subsequent experiences is well recorded. Now, as Roy grew up, his love of the outdoors that the farm instilled in him never went away. Instead of taking a desk job or working in a city, Roy became a park ranger. In 1936, he took a position in Shenandoah National Park, and would remain there for 40 years until his retirement in 1976. Roy F Sullivan's first documented lightning strike occurred six years after taking his post in the Shenandoah. Huh, that's interesting, isn't it? In April of 1942, a storm rolled in over the valley and Roy, perhaps weary from his close call in childhood, took shelter in the nearest fire lookout tower. Now, normally this would have been the perfect place to wait out the storm, but Roy didn't realize that this newly built tower lacked a lightning rod. Now, because of this, the tower had already been struck seven or eight times since its construction. And while hiding inside from the storm, Roy was there for the ninth strike. A bolt came down from the clouds and scored a direct hit on the fire lookout tower, setting the entire thing ablaze. And now, Roy is faced with a terrifying proposition. Stay in the tower and burn, or risk his luck in the thunderstorm. He later said that fire was jumping all over the place, so the choice was pretty easy. Now, he bolted down the stairs as fast as he could, the flames licking his heels as he went, and only a few feet after reaching relative safety of the ground, a second lightning bolt struck. This time, it was a direct hit to his body. Now, most of the injuries he sustained concentrated around his left leg, which was left with a half-inch burn. The lightning coursed down his leg before exiting through his big toe, leaving a hole in his boot. This was only the beginning of the journey for the man who earned the nickname the Human Lightning Conductor. Because nearly three decades later, this activity would only increase. In July of 1969, Roy was traveling along a mountain road in his truck when a storm had gathered. Normally, an automobile is one of the safest places to be in a thunderstorm. Between the rubber wheels and the way that the body of the vehicle acts like a Faraday cage, even a direct hit typically fails to harm anyone inside. But Roy had made a big mistake. Because the day had been so nice and the storm had come up so suddenly, that Roy had one of his windows down, meaning that there was nothing to protect him when lightning hit some nearby trees. The bolt jumped from the trees and directly through the open window of Roy's truck, striking him with full force. This time, Roy lost consciousness. When he came to, he found that his truck had simply rolled to a stop just before it would have tumbled off a nearby cliff. He had barely escaped death. Now, this second lightning strike claimed Roy's hair, eyebrows, and eyelashes, all of which had been burned off. Now, exactly a year later, and not six, Roy suffered his third lightning strike. This time, he was standing in his front yard when a bolt hit a power transformer nearby, and as with the incident in his truck, the bolt jumped from the transformer, following the path of least resistance, straight through Roy Sullivan. 
His injuries consisted of burns on his left shoulder. Now, thankfully, two years would pass uneventfully before he was struck again. And this time, Roy somehow knew it was coming. He would tell reporters about it it, with this unsettling premonition in early 1972. I'll tell you all something else. I dreamed in March that I'd be struck in April. I have a feeling I'm going to be struck again someday. I guess I'm just somebody who gets struck by lightning. Why would that be? Roy's predictive dream indeed came to pass on April 16th, 1972. Roy was working inside a ranger station in Shenandoah National Park when a lightning bolt struck an electrical box and then jumped straight towards his head, setting his hair on fire again. Like any of us would, Roy panicked trying to put out the flames and he tried using his jacket to smother the fire, but it didn't help. In desperation, he ran to the bathroom and tried to use water from the sink. After discovering that he couldn't cram his head under the faucet, Roy's quick thinking allowed him to grab a towel, soak it as fast as he could, and pat out the flames on top of his head. So this fourth or fifth lightning strike changed Roy in a big way. He had always chalked the strikes up to bad luck, but now he felt different. He felt like he was somehow marked, that sinister forces were targeting him for death or for some dark purpose. The year of his fourth strike, Roy told reporters, I've tried to lead a good life. I've never been a fearful man, but I have to tell you the truth. When I hear it thunder now, I feel a little shaky. I do not think God is behind this. If he were, the first lightning strike would have been enough. I don't believe that business about when you're born either. But it wasn't just Roy's mood that changed, his behavior changed as well. Whenever he was driving and a storm would roll in, he would always pull the car to the shoulder of the road and lay down on the front seat, just trying to make the target of his body as small as possible until the weather improved. And Roy began to believe that lightning would single him out every time, even in a group of people. In addition to everything he was required to carry as part of his job as a park ranger, he also carried a can of water just in case another lightning strike were to set him on fire. Unfortunately, he was right to be paranoid. His fifth lightning strike, can you believe that, also occurred while on the job. On August 7th, 1973, he was patrolling the park when he spotted a storm cloud. Now, his healthy fear of thunderstorms sent him driving away as quickly as he could. After several minutes of driving, Roy thought that he had put enough distance between himself and the clouds to get out of his truck. Big mistake. He was wrong. Moments after exiting the cab, Roy Sullivan was struck by lightning once again. Unlike his other strikes, Roy was able to get a clear view of the bolt as it traced across the sky, sing singling him out like some sort of electric predator. He described the sensation of being struck. They ever been shot real bad? It's worse. Ever been scalded? It's much worse. It's like being cooked inside your skin. Just before it strikes, I, I smell a certain smell like sulfur and my hair bristles all over, that's the signal. In about two seconds, no longer than three, it hits. Too late to hide. This time, the bolt struck his body, moving down the left side through his arm, his leg, and then finally through his foot. The blast sent his boot launching across the dirt. The lightning then jumped to his right leg just below his knee and exited. The blast also ignited Roy's hair again, and luckily he was still conscious. And his can of water was still sitting in the truck. He staggered to the vehicle, threw open the door, and quickly doused the flames. All of this would be enough to bring anyone to their breaking point. But we're not done yet, folks. There's more in store for Roy, unfortunately. Another lightning bolt hit Roy on June 5th, 1976. As had happened last time, Roy had spotted a cloud and tried to run away as quickly as he could, but on this occasion, Roy noticed something odd. Bizarrely, Roy said that the cloud didn't move like other clouds, that Roy swore to his dying day that this cloud followed him almost as if it was drawn to him in some 
unexplained way, or we might wonder as if it were intelligently controlled. At any rate, the cloud soon released a lightning bolt and you know how this goes by now. It hit Roy, the lightning set his hair on fire again. And by now, plenty of other people had noticed Roy's bad luck too, like Robert Jacobson, the superintendent at Shenandoah National Park from 1972 to 1986, and reportedly said, a long standing rule in the park was that if you see a dark cloud heading your way, get away from Roy Sullivan. Worse still, Roy noticed that others were noticing, and Roy would say, Naturally, people avoid me. I was walking with the chief ranger one day, and lightning struck way off, and he said, I'll see you later, Roy. There's a restaurant on Loft Mountain that even if it's just overcast, they won't let me in. I can't blame them. Who wants to be near somebody that's all the time getting hit by lightning? I wasn't right in the storm all those times. Once I was a good 10 miles away. But if there's a single dark cloud in the sky, out will come a boat and get me. And in that same year, Roy retired from the National Park Service at the age of 64. The next year, he experienced his seventh official and final lightning strike. It may have even been the most dramatic. Roy was enjoying his retirement. Despite a lifetime of threats from above, he never lost his love of the outdoors. And like Walter, he loved to fish. So on June 25th, 1977, Roy had set up at a local pond. He didn't have a care in the world and the last thing on his mind was another lightning strike. Well, maybe not the last thing because, you know, how could you not live in perpetual fear of intelligent clouds hurling lightning bolts at you? But I digress. The storm came up quickly, and remember, by now Roy is well aware of his bad luck. But before he can pack up and leave, the same thing happens. Lightning strikes him, traveling down his chest, setting his hair on fire, leaving burns all across his stomach and chest. Now, at this point, this experience is almost routine for Roy, but what happens next isn't. Roy naturally starts running to his truck, which is luckily nearby. But even though it's just a short distance away, he can't get there because you can't make this stuff up. A bear is blocking his way. So here's Roy. He's just been hit by lightning. His hair is literally on fire, folks. And somehow he has the presence of mind to do something that he's done every other time he's encountered a bear in the wilderness. He picks up a big stick and he rushes at the thing, smacking it a few times until it runs away. And after the bear retreats, Roy is free to open the door of his truck, retrieve his can of water, and put out the fire on his head. Now, needless to say, as wild as being attacked by a bear after a lightning strike seems, Roy Sullivan's entire lifetime is so unbelievable. So are there any holes in the story, or does it fall apart under closer scrutiny? just like the life of Walter Summerford. Well, as it turns out, all seven of Roy Sullivan's lightning strikes were thoroughly documented by Shenandoah National Park Superintendent R. Taylor Hoskins. This means that each of his strikes has an official record to go along with it. Remember, some of these incidents happened while Roy was at work, so there's definitely a paper trail to follow in those cases. We also have extensive testimony from Roy himself, as well as ample photographic evidence of his injuries. While every lightning strike didn't necessarily cause the same amount of damage, at least some of the strikes left Roy scarred. In this photo, you can clearly see the gnarly scars on Roy's back from his strikes. These fractal patterns, officially called Lichtenberg figures, are also referred to as lightning flowers or lightning trees. They often manifest on the chest, shoulders, neck, back, and arms of lightning strike victims. Honestly, it's surprising that Roy's whole body wasn't covered in these patterns. I mean, remember, on top of those seven official strikes, we have the incident from Roy's childhood with the lightning hitting the blade of the scythe. If we included that, Roy was struck by lightning a total of eight times over his life. Now, you might be asking, what are the odds of that? Well, according to National Weather Service statistics from 2018, the last three decades have seen an average of 43 reported lightning fatalities each year. 
This represents only 10% of actual lightning strikes on people. The other 90% typically experience varying degrees of disability after being struck, with only a handful of people suffering no ill effects. When you put all this together, the odds of getting struck by lightning are exceptionally low. While exact estimates vary, the National Weather Service places the risk around 1 in 1,222,000 for any given year. Over a lifetime of 80 years, those odds increase to 1 in 15,300. But remember, Roy was struck seven or eight times over his life, depending on whether or not you count his childhood incident. These odds decrease even more when you consider that there was yet another incident not factored into Roy Sullivan's final tally. You see, Roy was almost struck a ninth time, believe it or not. Roy's wife was also struck by lightning. She had been putting clothes out to dry on the clothesline when a storm blew in and didn't get to the house in time. Roy was right beside her helping her hang clothes and narrowly missed another strike himself, begging the question as to whether or not he was the actual intended target. After that, he said, when a storm blows up, I put my wife and three kids in the living room and go off by myself and sit in the kitchen scared. Needless to say, a lifetime of being hit by lightning took its toll on Roy. Not only did he fear to be around his friends and family outdoors, but the psychological toll was even worse. Roy passed away by his own hand on September 28, 1983. He was 71, and he left behind a strange legacy going down in the Guinness World Records as the record holder for the person struck by lightning more recorded times than anyone else in history. Today, his legacy lives on, his story has inspired art from music to video games to movies and documentaries, and you can see two of his park ranger hats still bearing the burn marks from his many strikes at the Guinness World Exhibit Halls in New York City and Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Speaking of park rangers, the next segment I wanted to revisit is actually a much more recent story I covered about an ex-ranger. This woman had an absolutely horrific experience that she still struggles to tell to this day. But I told her story so you could hear it. In the summer of 1987, a 36-year-old woman named Cheryl and her 14-year-old daughter moved to Dixon County, Tennessee to work at Ruskin Cave Recreational Park. The park sits on top of what locals called the mountain, with both Ruskin Cave and Jewel Cave carved into its limestone heart. And the mother, who had taken a job as part of the park's staff, was given living quarters right on the grounds with the other staff. Now, the mother was actually pretty excited about this new chapter. The living quarters were comfortable enough and they had everything they needed, a kitchen, bedrooms, and windows that looked out over the scenic cave grounds. And so for the first few weeks, everything was completely normal. The mother would sit, work her shifts at the park, her daughter would go to school, and they'd spend their evenings together in their little home on the cave grounds. Around the property was quite large with wooded areas surrounding the caves, a natural spring, and this beautiful creek that ran right through Ruskin Cave. One night in July, the mother was sitting at her kitchen table going through some paperwork from the day's tours when she heard a car pulling up to the park's main gate. It was about 10.30 p.m. and her daughter was getting dropped off from a local softball game. And normally, the mother wouldn't think twice about her daughter walking from the gate to the quarters. I mean, it was a short walk she'd done a dozen times before. The mother could see through her window as her daughter, still in her softball uniform and carrying this big bag of candy she'd bought from the concession stand, started making her way down the path that ran right alongside the creek. The creek was actually quite loud at night and the sound of running water would just sort of echo off the cave walls and created this constant background noise that everyone who lived on the grounds had gotten used to. And so the mother went back to her paperwork, but just a few moments later, 
the front door burst open. Her daughter stumbled in, literally shaking and her face completely white. The bag of candy was gone, and there was something about her daughter's expression and body language that told Cheryl something was very wrong. Her daughter tried to speak, but no words would come out. She just stood there trembling with tears streaming down her face, and as Cheryl wrapped her arms around her daughter, she noticed her back was all scraped up and her softball uniform was dirty like she'd been knocked down and as the mother was trying to calm her daughter down enough so she could explain what happened something made her glance toward the window and Cheryl began to scream while she clutched her daughter close to her standing there looking directly in at them was something so massive it blocked out most of the window frame and this large shape moved away from the window seconds later Cheryl and her daughter could hear something big moving around outside and it was moving toward the front door. And so Cheryl immediately grabbed her daughter and they ran to the back bedroom, barricading themselves inside while she frantically dialed the police. Her hands were shaking so badly she had to dial it twice. And the dispatcher could hear the panic in her voice as Cheryl tried to explain that something had attacked her daughter and was now outside their home. Well, the police arrived about 15 minutes later, and by then, whatever was outside was gone. Two officers walked the grounds with flashlights while Cheryl's daughter, still visibly shaken, tried to explain what had happened. She told them how she had been walking home, carrying her candy bag, when she heard these heavy splashing sounds in the creek beside her. And then something reached out from behind her and she described it as that this massive hand tried to grab her candy bag. And when she pulled back, she was knocked to the ground, which explained the scratches and scrapes on her back. The officers, of course, searched the area thoroughly, but found something strange. Now, despite the ground being soft from recent rain, they couldn't find any distinct footprints, just these odd depressions in the mud right near the creek. They did, however, find the torn candy bags scattered along the path and strangely none of the candy was actually taken now the senior officer who'd worked in dixon county for over 20 years seemed particularly interested when shale described what she'd seen at the window he pulled his partner aside and they had this kind of hushed conversation that Cheryl couldn't quite hear. But she noticed how they kept looking back at her and her daughter with this concerned expression. The height of whatever was at the window had to have been at least eight feet tall based on Cheryl's description way too tall for a person. Bears were common in the area, but bears don't reach through darkness to specifically grab bags, and they certainly don't peek through windows. Now, before leaving, one of the officers told Cheryl they might want to keep their windows locked for a while, especially after dark. The senior officer would later tell his wife that in all of his years of service, this was the first time he'd find a report and honestly had no idea how to classify what had happened. Well, a few nights after the incident, Cheryl and her daughter were just trying to get back to some sense of normalcy. They had this nightly ritual of sitting out on their front porch, sipping black tea, something they'd done since her daughter was little. And the tea was always served in these old ceramic mugs Cheryl's grandmother had given her, and normally this routine helped them both unwind from a long day. Now, from somewhere near the far edge of the property, past where Ruskin Cave opens up, came this sound that made them both freeze mid-sip. It wasn't like anything either of them had ever heard. It was this deep, guttural scream that seemed to kind of echo off the cave walls and bounced around the entire property. And it was so loud that even the crickets stopped making noise. Cheryl's daughter quickly grabbed her mom's arm so tight that tea spilt on the porch. The screaming continued and it was getting closer. It wasn't just one continuous scream, but rather these series of roars that would start low and then build up to this horrible pitch. And their neighbor's dog, which normally barked at everything, was now whimpering and scratching at their door to be let in. And so Cheryl and her daughter rushed inside after their fight or flight senses kicked in, locked the door, and spent the rest of the night listening to these screams move around the property, getting closer at times 
and then fading away again. Well, that night, after the screaming finally stopped somewhere around three in the morning, Cheryl managed to fall into an exhausted sleep on the couch where she'd been sitting with all the lights on. But her sleep was anything but peaceful. In her dreams, she kept seeing those massive hands she glimpsed at the window, only now they were pushing through her daughter's bedroom window, and in these nightmares, Cheryl would try to run to her daughter's room, but her legs felt like they were moving through molasses, and then that scream would start again only this time it was coming from inside the house. And so she'd wake up drenched in sweat and lightheaded and immediately run to check on her daughter. Now this happened three times that night and by morning, Despite the exhaustion, Cheryl set out in the light of morning to investigate near the creek after sending her daughter off to school. Near the creek where her daughter had been attacked, there were these large areas where the vegetation had been completely flattened, like something massive had been pacing back and forth all night, creating these almost perfect parallel paths through the tall grass. And there was this smell, it was like a mix between a wet dog and something else rotting. But what really got to her was finding one of her daughter's hair ties from the softball game lying in the middle of one of these pads. It was kind of stretched out like something huge had been playing with it. Now, Cheryl called in sick to work that day, and she just sat at her kitchen table, kind of just checking out, staring out the window at those flattened paths, jumping every time the wind moved the branches. Now, by this point, she hadn't slept properly in days and the lack of sleep was really starting to affect her. Dark circles had formed under her eyes and she started to notice her hands would shake every time she would hear a noise outside. The coffee maker in the kitchen had been running nonstop and she was on her sixth cup by noon. And so after picking her daughter up from school and making sure she was safely inside, Cheryl decided it was time to start asking around the neighborhood. I mean, even if people thought she was crazy, it didn't matter. Now that afternoon, she drove down Yellow Creek Road and stopped at a small white farmhouse that she'd passed every day on her way to work. An elderly couple, the Johnsons, had lived there for over 40 years, and if anyone would know anything about what was happening near the caves, it would be them. Mrs. Johnson was hanging laundry when Cheryl pulled up, and the moment Cheryl mentioned the screams, the older woman's hands stopped mid-motion, still holding a wet sheet, and she called over her husband, and soon, Cheryl found herself sitting at their kitchen table clutching a cup of coffee that Mrs. Johnson insisted she drink. I'm sure the seventh cup of coffee really didn't help Cheryl out here. Mrs. Johnson explained to Cheryl that they had been hearing those screams on and off for years now. In fact, the first time was back in 1952, right after they bought the place. And they initially thought it was a mountain lion, but as Mr. Johnson explained, mountain lions don't walk on two legs. And his wife kept nodding along as he spoke, just adding details about the little things they'd seen over the years. Now, strangely, Mrs. Johnson told Cheryl about their farm dogs and how these weren't just any dogs. These were animals that would chase off bears without hesitation, but there were certain nights where these same fearless dogs would suddenly start whimpering and hiding under the porch. And that's when they'd hear that same scream that started off far away, but would quickly move in and pace around their home. And at one point, Mrs. Johnson became very quiet, almost choked up. She brought up what happened to the tour guide at Jewel Cave, and apparently this woman named Sarah had been leading a group through the cave system last summer in 1986 when something began following them. According to Mrs. Johnson, Sarah had told her the thing stayed just at the edge of their flashlight beams, but they could all hear it splashing through the water. The entire tour group had ended up running out of the cave, and Sarah had quit that very day. Now, both caves, Ruskin and Jewel, were supposedly connected by underground passages. And now she was wondering if whatever had tried to grab her daughter was using those caves to move around the property. And so as Cheryl was getting ready to leave, Mr. Johnson suddenly remembered something. He disappeared into their back room and came out with this old worn leather bound journal. His father had been a surveyor for the caves back in the 1920s and he kept detailed notes about everything he'd encountered. His hands were shaking slightly as he opened the journal to a very specific 
specific page. Well, Cheryl's coffee cup slipped from her hands and shattered on the floor. There, in faded ink, was a crude drawing of exactly what she'd seen at her window. This massive figure with a flat face and round eyes. And the notes beside it described the same coarse, bushy hair she'd seen, even down to the length of two to three inches. But despite everything that had happened recently, the date of the entry was July of 1927, exactly 60 years before her daughter's encounter. The surveyor had written about how these things seemed to become more active in the summer and documented multiple instances of them trying to grab or lure children and teenagers always at night and always near water. Mrs. Johnson must have seen the color drain from Cheryl's face because she reached across the table and grabbed her hand. Now she spoke to Cheryl softly and just said, honey, maybe it's time you and your daughter found somewhere else to live. But Cheryl knew it wasn't that simple. I mean, she had taken the job because they needed the money and finding new work in Dixon County wasn't easy. I mean, besides, something in her gut told her that moving wouldn't solve the problem because whatever this thing was, it had already noticed them. And so Cheryl drove home and she was having the worst bouts of anxiety she'd ever had. The sun was setting and she knew her daughter would be finishing up her homework by now. So when she pulled up to her quarters, she noticed something that nearly made her choke. There were wet footprints leading from the creek to her front door. And these were massive prints, fresh enough that they hadn't dried yet. And they weren't the kind that walked away from the door, they just stop there as if whatever made them was still close by. So Cheryl sat in her car, the engine still running, staring at these wet footprints. Her daughter was inside and every maternal instinct was screaming at her to run in there, but another part of her brain was just trying to process what she was seeing. Each footprint was easily twice the size of a man's boot and there was something off about their shape, like whatever made them wasn't quite walking right. Cheryl's train of thoughts were shattered by the worst scream she'd heard yet. A different scream that wasn't coming from the woods or the caves, it was coming from inside her house. Cheryl grabbed the iron from her trunk and ran toward her front door. The screen was hanging off its hinges and she could hear what sounded like furniture being moved around inside. But she realized she was hearing her daughter's voice. She wasn't screaming, she was talking to something. And so Cheryl burst through the door and found her daughter standing in the middle of a living room, staring up at the ceiling. All the furniture had been pushed against the walls, like something had cleared a path to the room. And there's the smell, that same wet dog and rotting smell from the creek. It was overwhelming. Cheryl's daughter looked pretty disheveled, but not harmed. And without taking her eyes off the ceiling, she whispered cautiously to her mom that it's been up there in the crawl space and has been watching her. Cheryl slowly looked up, and there in the access panel to the attic crawl space, she could see these long, dark fingers curled around the edge of the opening. And as both mother and daughter stood in place, they could hear something much larger than any person slowly shifting its weight in the space above them. The tire iron in her hand suddenly felt useless as she realized just how massive whatever was up there had to be to even fit in that crawl space. The ceiling creaked again and a few bits of drywall dust kind of sprinkled down and her daughter, still staring up, whispered something that made Cheryl wince. It's trying to take me. And then they heard this low guttural noise coming from above, but it wasn't a scream. It was like it was trying to speak. And the words were garbled and deep, like someone trying to talk underwater. And it was very similar to this kind of samurai chattering. Cheryl grabbed her daughter's arm and started backing them both toward the front door. But as they moved, the thing in the crawl space moved with them, following their path from above. The ceiling joists groaned under its weight. They were almost to the door when Cheryl's daughter stopped suddenly. Her daughter ushered her to look at the window, and when Cheryl turned her head slightly, her heart nearly stopped. There, pressed against the glass was another face, flat with those same round eyes she'd seen before, but this one was smaller, like a child version of what she had seen. And behind it, she could make out more shapes moving in the darkness, and the realization 
hit her. They weren't just dealing with one, they were dealing with an entire group or family. And for some reason, they had fixated on Cheryl's daughter. The ceiling access panel suddenly crashed down behind them, and without thinking, Cheryl shoved her daughter through the front door, slammed it behind them, and the sound of splintering wood erupted from inside their house as something huge dropped down from the crawl space. But they couldn't stop to look because now they could see shapes moving all around the yard, ducking between trees, all of them heading toward the house. Cheryl's car at this point was only 30 feet away, but it felt like miles. They sprinted across the grass and Cheryl realized that some of these shadows weren't from the porch light at all. They were being cast by something much larger moving behind them. And just as they reached the car, she heard splashing sounds from the creek, the same sound her daughter had described the night she was attacked. The creek was alive with movement, like multiple things were emerging from the water all at once. They managed to get into the car just as something huge slammed against the driver's side window. Cheryl jammed the key into the ignition, floored it, gravel sprang as they tore out of there, and in the rearview mirror, she could see multiple large figures moving back toward the caves, just disappearing into the darkness. That was their last night at Ruskin Cave. They drove straight to a motel in Dixon and never went back to get their belongings. Cheryl called the park management the next morning and quit over the phone. When they asked her why the sudden decision, she refused to answer. A year later, in 1988, when investigators followed up on their encounter, they discovered something very interesting, that the entire area of Dixon County, Tennessee, had a long history of Bigfoot sightings, all describing creatures between eight to nine feet tall, with flat faces and round eyes, and covered in that same coarse, bushy hair. In fact, dozens of people in the surrounding neighborhoods had heard those same screams throughout that summer. And even now, hikers and cave explorers in Dixon County occasionally report hearing those same screams in and around the caves, especially on summer nights when the creek runs high. Cheryl's daughter still refuses to talk about what happened. If you thought that story was strange, wait until you hear Chris Bledsoe's series of strange experiences out in the woods. A man who, while living out in the woods of North Carolina, well, you'll just have to wait and see. Even though he's not located in Tennessee, North Carolina is still pretty close by and leaves plenty of room for these bizarre events. When you think of North Carolina, what comes to mind? The stunning Blue Ridge Mountains, the pristine Outer Banks, Mr. Beast's home state? But what if I told you that beneath the surface, in the dark woods and secluded corners of this state, lurks things that only exist in your nightmares? People have been reporting strange, unexplained phenomena in the North Carolina wilderness for decades. Encounters of beings and crafts that defy explanation. Sightings of things that simply should not exist. These aren't just campfire tales or urban legends anymore. In today's video, I will share four first-hand accounts from hunters who ventured into the woods and came back with experiences that would change them forever. These are the reasons why North Carolina is actually terrifying. On January 8th, 2007, Chris Bledsoe set out on what was supposed to be a regular hunting trip with his 17-year-old son and three buddies, Donnie Ackerman, David McDonald, and a guy named Gene. They headed towards their favorite spot near the Cape Fear River Wilderness in North Carolina. Now, this place is pretty isolated and off the beaten path. It's the spot you go to to get away from it all. So they get settled in for the night, set up a fire by the river, and just relax, shooting the breeze. On this night, it's so beautiful and peaceful. After relaxing for a little while, Chris decides to walk along a nearby trail, stretch his legs, and just take in the nighttime air. So he tells the guys what he's going to do and that he'll be back in a few. As he walked, he suddenly heard this strange ringing sound coming from both sides of the trail. Initially, he's not sure. He thinks it could be some deer or other wildlife rustling around in the underbrush, but something about the sound just doesn't sit right with him. It's too coordinated and too purposeful to be a random animal. 
Chris is a very experienced outdoorsman, like I'm sure many people watching this. He's spent enough time in the woods to know the usual sounds of nature and critters, but this sound is so off, it's unnerving to say the least. So out of reaction, he quickened his pace because he was unsure what he was dealing with. The entire time, he starts to get this feeling in his gut that something is wrong. Folks, don't ignore your gut instinct. It's usually right. And the more he walks in this direction, the stronger the feeling. Eventually, he finds himself in this large field near the main road. He still feels it in the pit of his gut, but he doesn't see anything or any reason for this alarm. He stopped momentarily to take a breather, looking around and scanning his surroundings. As he's scanning, his eyes catch something that's out of place. In fact, it's not just out of place, it shouldn't be there at all. Three large orange spheres are hovering just above the tree line, less than a mile from where he's standing. And they're moving downward, slowly, deliberately, until they stop. He is absolutely transfixed by what he's seeing. He can't believe his eyes. And these spheres were not like anything he'd ever seen before. They're not aircraft, they're not helicopters, they're not anything that he can explain. And they're just hovering there, silently, ominously. It's like they were watching him or studying him. Now, despite every instinct telling him to run, to get as far away from these things as possible, he just finds himself rooted to the spot. He's mesmerized, unable to look away, and he watches them for quite a while as they hover there in the air for a total of 10 minutes or so. He wasn't just standing there watching this, he was almost in like this trance state. It was very bizarre. After some time, he feels like he has snapped out of it and realizes the gravity of the situation. He needs to get back to the others, warn them before it gets worse. So he turns and starts running back towards the campsite and his heart is beating out of his chest. He's running, his mind is racing. What were those things? Where do they come from? Of course, he has no answers. And at this point, he's out of breath and very visibly shaken when he finally reaches the campsite. And the other guys can immediately tell something's wrong. They're all like, Chris, what happened? What, what's going on? But before he can even get a word out, he realizes his son is nowhere to be seen. And so panic sets in as he starts frantically calling out for him, running into the woods, desperately searching for any sign of him. This is a father's worst nightmare. His son is missing, and he just saw something he can't explain, something that shouldn't be there. The other guys join in the search, calling out his son's name and combing through the underbrush. And then, just as suddenly as he disappeared, Chris's son stumbles out of the woods. He's pale, he's shaking, and with a look of pure terror on his face. So Chris runs over, grabs him by the shoulders, and says, what happened? Where were you? Now, his son was barely able to speak, and all he mutters is, I saw, I saw something in the woods. It wasn't human. It wasn't an animal. It was something else. Now, Chris's blood chills because he knows deep down that whatever his son saw, it's somehow connected to those spheres, those things in the sky. But before he can press his son for more details, the other guys start shouting, pointing up at the sky. Now Chris looks up and sees something that makes his jaw drop, because there in the night sky are six to eight bright lights. At first they look like stars, but then they start moving and they're flying in from different parts of the sky, converging on each other like they're being pulled by some invisible force. And then right before their eyes, three of the lights line up side by side and start flying in formation. And they're heading straight for them, getting closer and closer. All the men are frozen now, unable to move or breathe, and the lights are so bright and so blinding that they have to shield their eyes. And then, just as quickly as they appeared, the lights flew over their heads and vanished behind the tree line on the other side of the river. And at that moment, Chris knows they need to get out of there, because whatever those things are, whatever they want, it can't be good. He starts shouting at the other men, telling them to grab their gear and leave now. But they're all in shock, trying to process. Chris has to practically drag them to their feet, shoving their gear into their hands. They leave everything else behind. The fire is still crackling. Nobody better tell Smokey the bear. The tents are still up. None of that matters anymore. 
All that matters is getting away from this place and getting to safety. They all pile in Chris's truck and he's flooring it, the tires spinning on the dirt road, and they're all just silent, lost in their thoughts, trying to make sense of everything. And just when they think it can't get any worse, when they think they might be in the clear, Chris suddenly slams on the brakes, the truck skidding to a halt. There, just above the road, is another object. But this one is different. It's not a sphere, it's egg-shaped and brilliant white, with a long tail and spikes jutting from the middle. It's like nothing they've ever seen, like from some sort of science fiction movie. The object is about 200 yards ahead, hovering silently above the road, maybe 20 feet or so. They could see this spiked section slowly rotating like it's scanning the area. The men are truly terrified now. This is happening too close, it's too real, they don't know if they've been seen or if they're in danger, and so they're just stuck watching this thing, daring to breathe, and suddenly it starts to rise up. And it moves up slowly, almost gracefully, before suddenly shooting off over the trees and out of sight. The men are left just staring at the empty road at the spot where the object had just been. It's like it was never there at all. Now, Chris doesn't wait around. He hits the gas and they speed off down the road. He's not taking any chances. He needs to get these men home, to get his son home. And as he's driving, he looks over at his son. The boy is pale, shaking, staring out the window like he's expecting the object to reappear at any moment. And so Chris just reaches over and puts a hand on his shoulder and tries to reassure him. But how do you reassure someone after something like that? How do you tell them it's going to be okay when you're unsure? Chris drops each of the men off at their homes, and they all live in the same general area, so it doesn't take long. But each stop is tense, each goodbye is rushed. They all just want to be inside, lock their doors, and try to forget this ever happened. Chris and his son arrive home at their own property, and they live on a sprawling six acres of land that usually feels like a sanctuary. But tonight, the darkness feels threatening. And now, they've only been home for about four hours when they hear a sound that terrifies them. It's like a jet engine, but much closer and right above the house. So Chris runs outside, looking up at the sky, but doesn't see anything. The sound fades away, and then just 30 to 45 minutes later, the dogs in the kennel start barking frantically. And it's not their usual bark, it's this panicked, fearful sound like they're facing down something terrifying. Chris's retriever is barking, staring intently towards the kennels, and Chris knows he can't ignore this, he has to check it out. And his son is scared, begging him not to go, but Chris knows he has no choice. He convinces his son to come with him, thinking it might be safer to stick together. And when they open the door, the retriever takes off like a shot running behind the kennels. Chris and his son follow, the barking getting louder and more frantic with each step. Around the corner, they see the dogs standing, their hackles raised, barking at something in the bushes. Chris squints into the darkness, trying to see what has got the dogs so riled up. But he just can't see anything. It's just shadows and vague shapes in the night. Now suddenly, the dog takes off again, but this time chasing something. Chris and his son run after her down the road that leads to the kennels into the backyard and all the way to the very rear of the property. They're trying to cut off whatever the dog is chasing to corner it. When they reach the blueberry hedge row at the back of the property, the dog abruptly stops. She's barking like crazy, a high-pitched sound, panicked. And that's when Chris sees it. Just a few feet away, there is something unlike anything he's ever seen. It's about four feet tall, unlike any animal he's ever encountered. It seems encased in a clear glass-like covering that gives off a faint red glow. He can't make out its face, but it appears to be wearing goggles and a dark mask. Now, he's frozen in shock, staring at this being, and his mind is just trying to process this. Is it a kind of alien, a government experiment? He has no idea. All he knows is that it is not of this world. The dog is still barking, inching closer to the thing, and Chris's son is right behind him, also staring in disbelief. And then this thing vanishes. It doesn't run away, it doesn't fade away, it's just gone like it was never there. Chris blinks and shakes his head, wondering if he's losing his mind, but then his son speaks 
with a trembling voice and tells his dad, that's what I saw in the woods at the campsite. It was the same thing. As you can imagine, Chris is overcome with complete dread. This wasn't a one-off encounter. These beings, whatever they are, seem to be following them, watching them. He ushers his son back to the house, the dog following closely behind. And once they're inside, he double checks all the locks, peers out the windows into the dark. He doesn't know what to do or who to call. Who would believe him? The police, the media? He'd sound crazy. Now in the following days, Chris couldn't shake the feeling that they were being watched. Every shadow seemed to hold a threat and every unusual sound made him jump. He was constantly on edge, always looking over his shoulder. His son would have nightmares, waking up screaming in the middle of the night. They were both struggling to just process this, but what did it all mean? Were they being invaded, studied, abducted? Chris didn't know. All he knew was that his life had changed forever that night in the woods, and he couldn't unsee what he had seen. Well, it wasn't long before he started doing research and looked into UFO sightings and other alien-related things, and he was surprised to find out how many people had experienced similar things. There were reports from all over the world dating back decades. People who had seen strange lights in the sky, encountering bizarre creatures, and even claimed to have been abducted. It was a rabbit hole that Chris found himself falling deeper into having experienced it himself. But the more he learned, the more questions he had. And folks, he believes that he was marked that day because he would have an incredibly bizarre experience just a few years later that he couldn't explain. Early in the morning of April 8th, 2012, just outside of Fayetteville, North Carolina, one of the strangest stories I've ever heard was about to unfold on this quiet rural property. Now, I wanna warn you that this isn't necessarily some typical monster in the woods or anything scary. It's just downright strange. It was around 3 a.m., which for anyone who knows anything about the witching hour, makes it intriguing that the following events happened at this time. This particular morning, it was rainy and foggy. Chris and his wife are sound asleep when they're suddenly awakened by a strange sight outside their window. Near a large tree, right near the rear of their home, they see what appears to be twirling sparks. Now, remember that because the weather is rainy and foggy, this is very out of place, and seeing sparks is unusual. Chris thought he was dreaming, but as he continued to look, fire erupted on the tree out of nowhere. Chris and his wife began to panic, and they rushed outside to put out the flames. After a few moments, they successfully managed to extinguish the fire, thinking the entire thing was just bizarre and they couldn't explain what they saw or how a fire had started. They began to head back to their home to go back to bed, but before they return, the fire somehow lights up again, not just once, but two more times. Exhausted and confused, Chris and his wife return to bed after continuously putting out the fire, this is already strange, but just wait. Chris and his wife make it back to bed, and they're both talking about how the fire starting was possible. Neither could explain it, and they keep checking out the window to ensure another doesn't start, and they're finally falling asleep. The next thing Chris knows is that he suddenly wakes up to the sound of a male voice that simply says, Arise. And when he opens his eyes, he's stunned, to say the least, because standing there, Right by his bed are several beings. These beings are tall, six to seven feet in height, and they have a bluish white color. He's frozen, he's confused, he doesn't know what to do or how to react, but then one of these beings reaches out and takes his hand and he's led to the rear of his house by the dog kennels. Now he's convinced he's having an out of body experience, but everything is so real. He's not dreaming, and he's looking around for signs that he's not awake or that this can't be reality, but it is. As they walk, the being bends down to pick something up from the ground and hands Chris a rough, sticky, rock-like object. It explains to Chris that this object is now his and that he must keep it. He's incredibly perplexed by this, thinking it must be a symbolic gesture, but he has no idea what it could mean. Now, at this point, he's unsure what to do or think because it's just so strange. 
And now he's standing alone by the dog kennels. The beings have disappeared and he's holding this strange object in his hand and feeling very uncomfortable. Now suddenly he feels a strong breeze from behind him. And when he reacts and looks back, he sees what appears to be a powerful translucent black bull charging toward him at full speed. Terrified, he doesn't know what to do. And as this comes upon him, he rolls into his stomach to protect himself, bracing for impact. But strangely, he feels nothing. It's as if the bull wasn't really there at all. And now he's even more confused and shaken. And suddenly he looks up and beholds a beautiful woman hovering about three feet above the ground, just about six feet away from him. The woman is angelic with stunning blue eyes and a glowing white robe. Now he's mesmerized by what he's seeing. Is this an angel? What or who is this? Now, folks, what happens next? It sounds like this should have been written by a Hollywood production team. I cannot make this up. But as wild as it is, this is exactly what Chris Bledsoe experienced in his account. Instantly, Chris hears a telepathic message from this angelic female figure, and from what he could understand, the message had to do with future events. He was told of a planetary alignment connected to the pyramids. As she relayed this message, he could see an image of the Sphinx in his mind, and he thought of the constellation of Leo. The female figure explained that this coming alignment represented a new knowledge for humanity. She mentioned that a red star would appear along with this alignment and that this new knowledge, although she didn't specify what it was, would come forth. Chris had the impression that all of this would occur in 2026. Now, after receiving this, the angelic figure just disappeared before him and he was left stunned, probably feeling like he was still in a dream and trying to process everything. He looked down at the strange object in his hand and couldn't know for the life of him what to do. And folks, this story keeps getting crazier. Now, as he kind of came to, he realized that the sun was starting to rise and he had been outside for hours at this point, but how could this be? He'd only been outside for a few moments or so he thought. All he could do now was return to the house, still in a complete daze. And when he returned to his bedroom, his wife was still asleep, unaware of the incredible events that had just taken place outside their home. And it's probably no shock to any of you that he didn't sleep at all. In fact, after trying, he gave up, sat down at the kitchen table, and just turned the rough rock-like object over in his hands. He knew what he had experienced was profoundly important, but he couldn't grasp its full meaning. And he could feel it in his innermost being that something significant had been opened up in him. It's like he had some sort of spiritual awakening. When his wife awoke, he told her everything and neither could make sense of the events or why he was chosen for this message. What was the image of the Sphinx, the mention of the constellation Leo, and the cryptic message about a planetary alignment in 2026? What did it mean, and what was his new knowledge that was supposed to come forth? Now, since this has happened, he's found some interesting connections, but nothing that fully explains his experience. Eventually, Chris came into contact with Albert Rosales and shared this bizarre and fascinating story that straight up feels like it could have been from the X-Files. Now, to this day, Chris is adamant about everything in his story being true, despite how utterly strange it is. But it's almost 2026, so it makes you wonder what's going to happen. As for the beings he saw that evening, why they chose to reveal themselves to him, and what his purpose is in all of this remains unknown. Speaking of unknowns... Jordan Greider is another strange case that baffled me during my research. It's not that he vanished, it's the condition in which his campsite was discovered and the circumstances surrounding it. Let me know what you think. In October of 2018, 29-year-old Jordan Greider established his campsite in northern Minnesota's Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, overlooking a beaver slough, which is a slow-moving swampy section of a river. On October 8th, Jordan photographed a beaver pond near his campsite. This detail is important for later. 
and the following day, on October 9th, Jordan left his campsite and drove to the nearest convenience store to purchase food and supplies. However, he wouldn't respond to text messages or phone calls, and his family began to get really worried about him after several days had passed. His family called the police, and once law enforcement drove there, they found no signs of Jordan. But they found his white truck parked in the front of a private gate off the Sioux Hustler Trail. Police knew that Jordan was an off-the-grid kind of guy who had already spent countless weeks living in the woods of Upper New York in Kentucky. Additionally, he had just finished celebrating his birthday a couple of weeks before with his parents and five brothers, so there was no conflict or any reason to ghost his family. Conservation officer Sean Williams led the search as they scoured slopes in the untamed wilderness using snowmobiles in search of Jordan. Williams knew that if they wanted to find him, they would have to search in places that would offer protection from the north wind during this time of year. I mean, this is not an easy place to be camping. It's extremely cold, with temperatures staying below zero and dropping 30 below at night factor in wind chill and 50 to 60 inches of snowfall, and it just makes for a brutal winter. Now, despite these challenges, authorities continue to search for Jordan. Still, because of the landscape's geography and the fast approaching winter, their resources were limited. Now, fast forward to April of 2019, and Williams discovered a very remote abandoned campsite. They were blood stains all over a sleeping bag, hammock, and a green tarp that hung over the hammock. Inside the hammock was an unused 9mm Beretta pistol with two magazines. Williams believed that this had to have been Jordan's campsite, but what happened, he wasn't sure. Unfortunately, at this time, the campsite was still under roughly two to four feet of snow. And so a few days later, the team returned after the snow had melted and discovered bones scattered around the campsite. And additionally, they found a shredded jacket and other bits of clothing. They discovered two more bones off-site after bringing in cadaver dogs and a larger team. Now, unfortunately, with 20 to 30 people doing the one-by-one -one grid walk, a skull was never found. They did find Jordan's cell phone, but after analyzing it, they realized that the last activity on his phone was a picture sent in a family group message sent on October 8th, 2018. Now, despite what little evidence Williams and the authorities discovered, none of it pointed to foul play or suicide. Fast forward again to August 21st, 2020, when the University of North Texas Health Science Center for Human Identification confirmed that the bones found belonged to Jordan Greider. But the clues found at the campsite pointed to something more ominous. Jordan's family hypothesized that when Jordan went to sleep the first night in his hammock, he was attacked by a group of wolves, which would make sense considering wolf tracks and scat were found. But most of the blood spatters were found inside the hammock, and there were no signs of a struggle with a wolf, let alone an entire pack of them. Thomas Gable, an expert on wolves at the University of Minnesota, explained that because wolves are messy killers, there just wasn't enough carnage at the campsite to justify it being a wolf kill. Additionally, no bite marks were reported on the bones or the hammock being damaged if the wolves had removed Jordan's body post-mortem. And one of Jordan's favorite hobbies was to whittle wood, and he often took multiple knives with him, which he kept very sharp and used for shaving. But the several knives that were found at the campsite were all sheathed and contained no traces of blood. The known detail in this case is that Jordan seemed to have been attacked while sleeping in his hammock. The question remains, who or what could have attacked him with such force and speed that he couldn't use his pistol? There is online speculation that this was clearly the work of a Bigfoot or Wendigo that had come into his campsite at night, attacked and killed him, and then took off with his body, or parts of his body. 
and that wolves came in post-mortem and ate what remained of Jordan. To this day, there is still no official cause of death for Jordan Greider, even though the case is closed. What happened to Jordan that October night in 2018 remains a mystery. Weird, right? This next segment continues our theme of strange things happening in the woods, specifically in California. Two surveyors got more than they bargained for when they ventured into the Trinity National Forest, and I don't really want to spoil it for you, but it is strange. In the summer of 2008, two young men named Michael and Cody were out doing their normal survey work for the Trinity National Forest in California. They're basically spending their days collecting water samples from different creeks and springs throughout the forest. And normally, this was a pretty straightforward job. These two guys had been working together as surveyors for TNF for about three years. And this particular area was actually part of their regular rotation. And so they're driving down this really rough dirt road in their work truck. And it's the kind where you're basically bouncing around the whole time because there's just so many potholes and roots. Now they finally get to this spot where they can't drive any further. And now they've got to grab all their equipment. And we're talking about their collection vials, their testing kits, their GPS units, all that stuff and hike the rest of the way on foot. And so they're out there for most of the afternoon and everything's totally normal. They're checking off their list, getting samples from all these different water sources, making their coordinates, you know, doing what they do. And the temperature's probably in the mid 70s. It's a clear day. It's a slight breeze, just perfect for field work. It's getting to be around 3.30 in the afternoon. And they're thinking, okay, we just need to get a few samples. That's all we have left. And then we can head back and be done for the day. Remember, these guys had done the exact same route probably a dozen times before. Now, this rock formation they needed to climb over, it wasn't necessarily challenging, maybe about eight or nine feet, just enough that you needed to use your hands to kind of scramble up it. The lead surveyor, he's carrying most of the testing equipment in his backpack, and his partner's got the GPS unit and the collection containers. The lead surveyor gets to the top first, and then something really strange happens. He just stops dead in his tracks. His partner, who's right behind behind him actually runs straight into him and is like, hey, why'd you stop? His partner drops one of the collection containers when he runs into him and it goes rolling back down the rock. But even he's not thinking about that anymore because he can see his friend's face and this guy who he's worked with for three years, who he's never seen rattled by anything, not bears, not mountain lions, nothing, is standing there with this look of absolute terror on his face. But the lead guy, he can't even speak. He's just standing there, his arms kind of waving around, totally unable to say anything. And so his partner is getting frustrated and just pushes past him to see what the problem is. What they saw next would completely change both of their lives. When the second guy looks down towards the creek, what he sees makes absolutely no sense. There's this large, smoky gray colored humanoid, and it's actually standing in the creek, stabbing at fish with some kind of sharp stick. Now, at this point, both men are frozen, totally unable to process what they're looking at, and whatever this is must have sensed them staring at it because it suddenly looked up at them, and when it did, they could see this absolutely terrified expression on its face. This thing is probably around seven feet tall, and its arms are so long that when it bends over to fish, they nearly touch the water even from its full standing height. And these guys are trained observers. Their entire job is about documenting and recording precise details about the environment. There's no protocol for this. There's no box to check on their data sheets for massive humanoid creature fishing in the creek. When this thing looked up at them, they said its face had these really human-like features but distorted somehow. And then this thing does something really bizarre. It leaps up onto this massive boulder and it's still staring directly at them. It raises these huge hands attached to these incredibly powerful arms, and it slaps the boulder so hard, it makes this loud smacking sound and propels itself into the air onto another rock, still keeping its eyes locked on these two men, and then another slap, a third boulder, and with one final smack, it disappears into the tree line. Now, these two surveyors who had been totally frozen in place they just take off running back to the forest and they're not even taking the trail they came in on. 
They're just crashing through the underbrush, jumping over fallen trees, basically taking the most direct route back to their truck possible. Now, they said later that they could still hear these weird echoing sounds behind them, but neither of them dared to look back. When they finally got to their truck, they were so shaken up that it took several attempts just to get the key in the ignition. And when they got back to the office, they didn't even file a report. They just turned in their samples from earlier that day and went home. The lead surveyor called in sick the next day, and when he came back, he put in for a transfer to a different district. These men who had been doing this job for years flat out refused to ever go back to that location again. And one of them, to this day, absolutely refuses to even talk about what happened. Both of these men were Native American who had grown up in the area and knew just about every animal that lived in these forests, who had spent their entire lives hearing the traditional stories about these things. Unfortunately, the identity of whatever it is they saw that day will remain a mystery. As far as what they saw, it's hard to say. The description they gave was very interesting. However, some of my favorite mysteries to cover are things that are truly down deep in the water. Maybe it's because the water is so mysterious, places we can't normally get to on their own. And this final segment comes from a very recent episode and takes us beneath the surface of Lake Seneca. Enjoy. On July 14th, 1899, Captain Carlton S. Herendine stood at the helm of a paddle steamer called Otetiani as it made its way across Lake Seneca in New York. The lake itself had always been a source of mystery because long before any European settlers had arrived in the area, local Native American tribes would tell stories about this body of water. Deep beneath the surface, lived what they called a fierce beast. Most people dismiss these stories as folklore, as tall tales passed down through generations, but, but something happened in the summer in 1899, something that would prove that these stories were based on something very real. Around 7 p.m., the Otetiani was filled with passengers enjoying a pleasant evening cruise across the lake. Captain Herondine and his bosun, Frederick Rose, were chatting casually when they both noticed something strange in the water about 365 meters ahead of them. At first, they thought they were looking at an overturned boat. It was dark in color, about 15 or so feet long, with what appeared to be a very sharp prow right right at one end and a long narrow stern at the other. So Captain Herondine first thought that there had been some kind of accident. He immediately ordered the steamer to slow down and adjust course. If there were people in the water, they needed to get to them fast. But as the crew prepared to lower their rescue boat, something very strange happened. This overturned boat suddenly began moving through the water, and not in the random way that debris gets pushed around by wind and waves. This was deliberately sailing in a specific direction. So Captain Herondine, now totally confused by what he was seeing, steered the Otetiani to follow this strange object, and that's when everyone on board got the shock of their lives. The narrow front end of what they thought was a boat suddenly opened up revealing two rows of razor sharp white teeth. And Captain Herondine would later describe that what they were actually looking at was far bigger than they'd initially thought. This thing was nearly 25 feet long with a massive tail that tapered down right before winding at the end like a whale's. He estimated it to be somewhere around a thousand pounds, but what caught everyone's attention the most was its head, about four feet long and triangular with a mouthful of teeth that looked like a bizarre mix of a shark's and a sperm whale's. And the creature's body was what appeared to be covered in some thick armor-like plating similar to a tortoise shell. And even the color was odd. It was like this strange brownish color with a green tint. Though when they caught glimpses of its underbelly, they could see it was creamy white and its eyes were perfectly round like a fish's, but they never seemed to blink. And even for this captain who had been sailing these waters for years had never seen anything like this. Perhaps it was the adrenaline pumping through his system or it was just pure instinct, but he made a decision 
right then and there that would sound crazy to anyone who wasn't there. He immediately ordered his crew to speed up the steamer. He was going to ram this thing head on. He gave the order, told the crew to prepare all their life-saving equipment. He wasn't stupid. I mean, he knew that trying to ram what appeared to be some kind of prehistoric monster might not exactly end well for the steamer either. In fact, the Washington Weekly Post would later publish an incredibly detailed account of what happened next. The Otetiani backed away to get some distance, then turned around to line up its attack. When Captain Herendeen gave the signal for full speed ahead, you could feel the tension on the deck Every passenger stood there watching as this thing seemed to have crawled straight out of their worst nightmares. Whatever was in the water was smarter than they expected because as the steamer charged forward, it looked like right at them. Almost like it knew exactly what they were trying to do, and at the last possible second, it dove under the water, and the Otetiani passed right over where it had been, and some passengers would later swear they could see its dark outline moving beneath the surface. Just as the steamer was about to continue on its regular route, a woman's scream cut through the air. Everyone turned to look where she was pointing, and there it was. It had surfaced again about 50 yards away, almost exactly where it had first disappeared under the water. This time though, Captain Herendeen changed his strategy because instead of trying to hit the thing head on, he maneuvered the Otetiani so the starboard paddle wheel would catch it right in the middle of its body. Now the steamer picked up speed again, but unlike before, the creature didn't notice the danger this time and maybe it was tired, maybe it didn't expect them to return for round two, but the impact that followed was this loud, horrible, dull thud that everyone heard and felt deep in their bones. The force of the collision was so violent that passengers were thrown across the deck like ragdolls. And for a terrifying moment, the steamer itself nearly capsized. If it hadn't been for the crew's quick action, it probably would have. Now what followed was perhaps the most terrifying moment of the entire ordeal, complete and utter silence fell over the ship. The only sound was the steady chug of the engine. Nobody moved, nobody spoke. They all just stood there waiting to see what would happen next. And then they saw it. This large shape was just floating beside the ship with a massive hole torn in its side. In what would be its final moments, it lifted its head one last time, made what witnesses described as a sound like a sigh, and then went still. The impact of the ship had broken its spine. The monster of Lake Seneca was dead, but things weren't over yet. The crew quickly lowered a boat and began to try to secure the carcass with hooks and ropes. Everyone on board pitched in to help haul this impossible thing out of the water. They had most of it clear of the surface for a brief moment, but then everything just went wrong. The rope near the tail suddenly slipped and that massive tail section dropped back into the water and the sudden weight shift was too much. The other ropes started sliding through people's hands no matter how hard they tried to hold on. And within seconds, they had no choice but to let go and the entire carcass splashed back into the lake. As soon as that body touched the water, it began to sink. The spot where it went down was over 600 feet deep. And as everybody knew all too well, anything that sank that deep in Lake Seneca never came back up. They all just stood there helplessly, watching their proof of this incredible encounter disappear into the black depths forever. But before it sank, several very credible people had gotten a good look at it. These weren't just random passengers. We're talking about Albert L. Fowl and D.W. Hallenbeck, both public works officials. George C. Shell, who was a police commissioner. Fred S. Bronson, who managed the Geneva Telephone Company. Charles E. Kuhn, a Philadelphia business salesman. And even a professor named George R. Elwood, who's a geologist from Ontario. And so when newspapers across America started running this story, there was endless speculation about what this could have been. And Professor Elwood had seen it with his own eyes and had a pretty interesting theory. He believed it might have been a Cladastes, which is an extinct prehistoric sea lizard from the Mosasaur family. He figured these creatures could have survived by hiding in the underwater caves and tunnels that kind of honeycomb at the bottom of Lake Seneca. Other people thought it might be some kind of whale that had somehow made its way into the lake, or perhaps a giant 
giant fish or even a massive turtle. Some believed it was something completely new to science, but whatever it was, after that day in 1899, it was never seen again. Those old Native American legends about a fierce beast living in Lake Seneca, well, maybe they weren't just stories after all. Maybe that creature the Otetiani ran that summer evening was the last of its kind, the final proof of something that had lived in those waters for thousands of years. And now it rests somewhere in the depths of that lake. And for all we know, there could be more hiding in those underwater caves. I mean, after all, Lake Seneca still holds plenty of mysteries. And sometimes, as this story proves, the most unbelievable legends have a grain of truth. And that's gonna do her for today's episode. If you guys not only enjoyed this compilation, but you've made it this far, comment down below the woods with a period. So that way I know who made it to the end and who didn't. And if you guys enjoy videos like this where we deep dive into strange cases of the mysterious and supernatural, then what are you waiting for? Slap that like and subscribe button right now for more content just like this. As always, never forget, I love you all, keep an open mind, and I'll see you all in the very next episode.